We have a fascinating and quite a daring adventure as speaker today. I'm sure many of you must have read about Dr. David Gething in the media a few months ago as the winner of the World Marathon Challenge of 2015 when he ran seven marathons in seven continents in seven days. I'm sure many of you, like myself, were thinking, what an incredible test of human endurance. But at the same time, why would anyone attempt such a grueling challenge? Why, David? The route started in Antarctica Union Glacier, then Chile, Miami, Madrid, Marrakesh, Dubai, and then finished in Sydney. He beat out 11 runners from around the world. Our speaker will talk about the highs and lows of this adventure, the extensive preparations involved. He will also discuss his passion for long distance events, in particular how he started out as an out of shape father who was 40 kilos overweight, extra overweight, then progressed to becoming a champion marathon runner that it, he is today, who set two new world records thanks to his win from the World Marathon Challenge. When the athlete is not racing to the finish at major ma marathons or triathlons around the world, David is a veterinarian surgeon with a practice in Hong Kong. Uh, all this, David's efforts is also to support a children's charity called Sunbeam Foundation, which benefits disadvantaged youth in southern China. There's a donation box at the counter over there, so any contribution would be much appreciated. So anyway, let's hear his story. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Dr. David Gaffin. Thank you. Wow, so many friendly faces here. I'm quite surprised. I was kind of told to be probably two people who turned up and sitting in the corner, so thank you all. And I was <clears throat> happy enough to see someone I haven't seen for years, who's an old friend and famous anchor man who once told me a story, who's in the audience today, who once told me a story of when he was on live international TV and was lost to words. So I figure if it happens to me today, it's happened to the best of them. I can handle that. That'll be all right. So as far as it goes, let me just get this slideshow started. Maybe I can get one of them in to come and get the slideshow started. Let's try again. So, <clears throat> seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. Um, that was the, the challenge, I don't know what you call it, the adventure, the epic, um, that I decided to do at the start of this year. And it was run as a race. It was, it was run as a race, as you heard, against 11 other people. And these were people from all around the world. Um, there was two people from India. There was a guy from the US, um, England, Ireland. There's a girl from Finland. Uh, there's an Australian. And there was me from Hong Kong. Um, it was amazing. And it was wonderful. And it was incredible. And it was brutal. I never, ever want to do it again. Um, <laughs> it was, <coughs> I don't know what I was thinking. Um, as you heard, I was, I was fortunate enough to win. Um, I set a world record in Antarctica um, for the fastest ever marathon run on the continent. Um, I also set a world record for the fastest cumulative time for seven marathons on seven continents in seven days. And I guess... <coughs> uh, <coughs> oh, thank you. Um, it was, the Antarctica one was the cool one. That was pretty, that was pretty special. Anyway, I'll come to that. Um, the funny thing about it all, really, is I was never that guy, you know? I, I wasn't a lifelong athlete, and I was never the guy you'd expect to be here. And there's a few people in the audience who know me from back in the day, um, but I certainly wasn't what you call Mr. Fit at all. Um, but I am the guy who probably knows the moment their life changed, and that, for me, was seven years and five months ago. Um, I was outside our flat, and I was smoking a cigarette after I'd told my wife that I'd given up for the umpteenth time. <clears throat> and I came back in, and she sat me down, and she said to me, your daughter's going to be born in three months. And whatever you are, she's going to look up to you, and she's going to come to emulate you. 
and I love you exactly the way you are, but you're overweight and you're drinking a lot and you're smoking a lot. And <clears throat> I don't know, it's a funny one, you know, you can, you can kind of deny a lot of stuff in yourself and you can kind of pretend it's not there, but when someone shines it through the prism of somebody else and you can see what it'd be like if someone else was that person, it's much clearer. And it was clear for me at that moment that that wasn't the guy or the girl that I wanted my daughter to become. Um, so from that day I changed and I gave up smoking and I didn't ever smoke again. And I got on my bike. <clears throat> And I was riding up the local hill in my house, uh, near my house, wearing board shorts and a t-shirt. Because I, I can tell you, if you're, if you're a big guy, you don't go out wearing lycra. It's not flattering to start with. So I was, I was huffing and puffing up this really tall hill. And, and these three guys who are still very dear friends to this day, um, the three guys I've never met before, came, came past. And I like, bang, bang, bang on their bikes. And these guys were were lean and they were fit and they were tough and that was, that was who I wanted to be, these sort of, these real men. Um, and finally I got to the top of the hill and they were kind enough to have waited for me. And they said to me, come along. And I said, there's no way, you know, I can't do that. No, no, come along, come along. And so finally I said, okay, I, I rode with them. And five minutes later I was dropped off the back of their pack and left in the dust. But I was stupid enough to come back, and come back again and again. And <clears throat> it went from five minutes to 10 minutes to, to 20 minutes. And then I finished the whole ride with them. And I knew it was sort of time to set up, to sort of start for a race and try and get more. So I did this 5K little running race. And I came pretty close to the back for when I finished, but I finished. And I thought, okay, if I can do that, <clears throat> I can do a 10K, I can do whatever, um, and I went from 10K to, to triathlon, to marathons, to, to Ironman, and I got to world championship Ironman a couple of times, and I thought, what next? You know, what else do I do? I'm, I'm never been happy to sit and just, to, so I had to do something else, partly to keep myself motivated to make sure I didn't put all that weight back on, you know, to scare myself a bit. And I thought, I want to try and run a marathon on every continent. And then I thought about it some more, and I thought, you know, I'd like to try and do that in a week. So I went away, <clears throat> and I, I, I got onto Google. I sort of had this route map plan. I was going to start here and do this, that, and the other. And I emailed the only guy I could find on the internet with an email address who had apparently done it before. And I said to him, look, I want to do this. What do you think? And he said, actually, you know what? I'd actually really like to do it again, too but I reckon I'd like to put a race together and get a whole group of people together and we'll do it and whatever. And he said, look, you'll hear back from me, just leave it at that. So I thought, okay, left at that. Six months later, I get this email from my inbox. David, I've got 11 guys. There's one space left. Are you in or are you out? And there's kind of one rule in our house about these stupid adventures is that I get permission from Trilby, my wife, before I go and do any of them. Um, because you should see how many ideas she stopped me doing in the last five years. So I went to her and I said, look, I really want to do this. What do you think? And she said, it's going to take a lot of time away from your family. You're going to have to train a lot. And it's going to be really expensive. But if you really want to, I'm with you. So respect for her. She, she, she was the person who made the difference. Um, so the next person I emailed was my coach. Because if, you, if you're ever doing any running stuff or any athletic stuff, <clears throat> if, you're, if you're starting, wherever you are, if you're starting or if you're the best in the world, you need a coach. A coach will save you so much time. They'll teach you what to do. It's, it's money well spent. Email my coach, Nigel. And I said, Nigel, I've got this idea. I want to do this. And he emailed me back and he goes, you are an idiot. What are you <laughs> thinking? <clears throat> and he said, okay, look, we can do this. The real problem is... I don't know what to tell you because I've never trained anyone to do a race like this before because, frankly speaking, there's never been a race like this before. But I reckon you're going to be doing a lot of running for the next six months. And look, he was right. And to give you a bit of sort of like a <clears throat> an idea on this, I'm a, I'm a normal guy like everyone else. And, you know, I have two kids and I have two dogs and I have a job and I, I live a normal life. So I had to get up each day my average day was to start at about 4 to 4.30 in the morning, depending on the day. Um, <clears throat> I would get up and I'd go for a run. I ran about five times a week. 
Um, and during my peak weeks, I was doing about 120 Ks running a week. I'd also do two bike rides, two to three bike rides a week, probably about 200 Ks on the bike, and two swims a week for cross training, and three gym sessions, but just short gym sessions to keep it all evened out. Um, <clears throat> get home, shower, change, out the door, and work way at 8 a.m. in the morning. Come, go work the whole day, come home, and kiss the kids, and then fall asleep in bed, and do the same thing again. And that was every day for six months. And that was great, that was, that was, <clears throat> that was cool, I got quite fit. Um, and I, that took me to the start of Antarctica. Um, actually, to, to, to go back a sec, that got me to South America. And so I arrived in South America, in, in, <clears throat> in Punta Serenas, which is where we, where we had to get on the, the, the... Basically what we'd done is we'd hitched this ride on this Russian cargo plane. It was a military cargo plane. And it was transporting Argentinian soldiers from their base in Ushuaia to Belgrano, which is about 600 k's from the, from the South Pole. Because getting to Antarctica is, there's no regular scheduled flights, there's no other way to do it. To get to the inland, right into the center of Antarctica, you have to be basically going to a base. Um, <clears throat> so I got on this plane, and this plane was cool. This plane was like old school Russian. And, and there was pipes hanging from the ceilings, and there was wires, and there was stuff in the Cyrillic alphabet with like exclamation marks upside down that I had no idea what it meant. But I'm thinking, okay, just sit in the corner, and it's be cool, it's fine. Um, and flying there is kind of a weird thing because there's nothing in the center of Antarctica. There's no, there's no trees, there's no houses, there's no runways, there's no control tower, there's no beacons, there's nothing. Um, there's just a big strip of ice. And they're trying to land this hundred and something ton cargo plane on this, on this strip of ice. Um, so it has to be perfect. And there can't be any wind or the plane will slip. Uh, there can't be any fog because the plane has to be uh, like an entirely visual landing when it comes in. Um, there's no, no instruments to work from. And it can't be at all warm, because if it's warm, the ice will melt when the plane touches it, and it'll skid off the runway. Um, but anyway, we, we landed, and we got there, and the crew was awesome, and they did a great job. It was one of the softest landings I've had. And that was, that was I guess, all of you guys have had some kind of experience in your life that you never forget. And something is just amazing and it's burned into your memory. And for me, when those cargo bay doors opened in Antarctica and I saw it for the first time, it, it was one of those moments. Um, that's the runway with the plane on there. Um, and it was just vast white. There was nothing. There was no, it, was, it was crisp. It was clean. It was just, you could see for what seemed like 100 kilometers. And it was, it was beautiful. Although on saying that, I was probably fairly easy to impress, seeing as I'd never actually seen it snowing before. Um, that was my first time in the snow, and that was amazing. Anyway, the plane can't stay on the runway, because the plane will freeze to it. So the plane had to take off and go, and we went to the base camp. And we had to amuse ourselves for a couple of days. So being a cyclist, I did find an, an Antarctic bike, and I decided to ride it around a bit. Um, but anyway, we had to wait till the plane came back. The, the reason is, from the time the starting gun goes, we had 168 hours to get to the finish line in Sydney. And there's no exact schedule with these flights. We had to wait till the plane was coming back before we started running. Waiting, 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 waiting. Finally, at 11 p.m. at night, there's a knock on the door. Plane's in the air. You've got to go. We're on now. And it kind of doesn't matter what time of day it is, because it's sunlight 24 hours a day, so it's fine. Um, and they said, OK, get your stuff on. Get to the medical tent. Yeah, we, we need medical briefing, then you're on the start line. So I got to the medical tent, and the camp doctor stands up, and he says, I'm going to tell you one thing. If you sweat, you will die. Because if you sweat, it's going to be soaked up by your shirt, and your shirt will form a plate of ice against your chest. It will soak all of the heat out of your torso. You'll become hypothermic, and there's nothing we can do down here. Um, and that was great, seeing <laughs> I'm a guy who spent his life training in semi-tropical Hong Kong, teaching myself to sweat for a living. I'm thinking I'm in trouble here. Never run in the snow before, never seen snow before. Um, but this is the funny thing, this is, so this is the trick, is, is basically what you had to do is dress, dress light enough that you weren't going to sweat and use your body heat to keep you going. Um, so for me that meant a long sleeved shirt and a t-shirt and basically the same on the bottom. Um, and there's this dangerous gamble because you can't run fast enough that you sweat but if you run slow enough, you're also going to get too cold because you're not generating body heat. 
So you can't stop running. You know, you, you've got to keep in this sort of zone of keeping your body temperature okay. But that's fine. You know, put it behind, you get to the starting line. And the starting gun goes off. Um, and I don't know, anyone runners in the audience? Maybe, maybe not. If you're a runner, occasionally you have days where you just feel brilliant. And the wind is at your back, and the spring is in your step, and you're like a gazelle. And for me, this was one of those days. Um, it was just amazing. And I ran, and I didn't really look at my watch that much. I just ran and I had fun. Um, I got halfway round, and the race director um, said, you're, you're half an hour up, and the guy in second place. And I thought, holy smokes, because that guy in second place looked pretty fit. And this is not a day race. You know, this is a week. You've got to sort of save something for tomorrow. And then I thought, well, I'm only in Antarctica once, so I'm going to give it a bit of a shot and see what happens. So I kept running hard, and sort of stupidity overtook me. And got to the finish line. It was all good. Um, finished, and I, I kept half an hour. And they, they told me I'd set a world record as I finished, which was awesome. I took off my socks, and I had frostbite and two toes, um, which wasn't so awesome. But you know, life goes on. Um, and the best news of all, we made the plane going back to Punta Arenas, got back on the Russian plane, it was all good. Um, so I got to Punta Arenas, and that was quite beautiful. Um, it, was, it was sort of right on the bottom of, of Chile, you know, windswept, rugged, barren, rotting hulks of ships from the turn of the century, you know, wharves slowly decaying back into the oceans. It was, it was, it was cool. And we ran up and down the, on the shorefront, and I was still on a high from Antarctica. And I ran well. I, I, I took about another 15 minutes lead, and so I had 45 minutes up altogether. I was feeling pretty good. Um, <clears throat> and I get this email from my coach, from Nigel. And Nigel goes, David, I hope you're really proud of yourself. I hope you think you're the big man, you set this Antarctic record, and you're really clever, and you've done all this stuff, and you think how clever you are, but you've stuffed it. You have blown this race. And if you keep running like this, you can forget about winning because you're not going to finish. You know, you are, you're blowing yourself to pieces on this thing and you're, you, you're being an idiot. And he was joking, but he was also completely right. Um, the guy in, first, in second place and I were tearing strips off each other each day to try and get a win. Um, and it wasn't sensible. And so we got together. And a few of us got together and we sort of said, look, you know, what do we want to do here? You know, we can, we can fight all the way and we're all going to injure ourselves, and probably going to injure ourselves out of this. Or we can run together. You know, we don't, we've got nothing to prove to each other, we're all friends, we come from the experience, let's just do it together. And so we did. Um, we decided, you know, when I'm down, you'll pick me up, when you're down, you pick me up, and let's, let's keep going from there. Got to Miami, and we ran together. It was, it was lovely. It was, it was South Beach, Miami, and it's... Um, Girls in bikinis and guys pumping iron, and it was just exactly what you expect from Miami. It was cool. It was awesome. And we all had big grins on our face. We all finished together. It was a good day. Um, and we got to Madrid, and Madrid was cold. It was pretty brutal just running around this lake. Um, but again, we ran together, and we kept each other going. That was cool. That was fine. Um, and then we got to Morocco. And if Morocco, if, if Antarctica was my high point... Morocco was just my low point. It was awful. Um, I, was <clears throat> I was really tired, because it was only six hours after we finished Madrid that we were starting in Morocco. They're pretty close. Um, so I was so tired from the last marathon. Um, we landed at midnight. <clears throat> I've got no photos when we landed, because it was too dark. The photos, the camera didn't work. It was too dark. Um, but we landed at midnight. It was raining. It was eight degrees Celsius. We had to start right then. We drove out to a small block on the outskirts. So it was three kilometers. So we had to run around 12 times in the dark. And just before I started, I got an email with a picture of my five-year-old daughter starting her first day of school without me being there. And that was just it. I was, I was, <clears throat> I was I'd had enough. And <clears throat> excuse me, it was, it was a pretty emotional time. And I confided in Big Jim, one of the other racers, and he was a lovely guy. I said, Big Jim, it's been nice to know you. I, I, I can't do this anymore. I'm out. Um, you know, we'll keep in touch, but it's, it's, I'm over. And he said, you too, huh? Because I'm pretty much done. And 
respect to him, he got me to the starting line. And he said, look, let's get on to the starting line. Let's start. Let's see what happens. Let's take it from there. And we did. And it was awful, but we did it. Um, <clears throat> halfway around, it was dark, and I wasn't paying attention. I hit a pothole, and I fractured my right ankle. Um, I got a stress fracture, so I could still run on it, but it was pretty sore. I didn't realize until the next day. Um, it was broken. But I finished. And sometimes your hardest days, your slowest days, are kind of your best days, because you actually did it. And um, that was pretty cool. So I got to the finish line. It was over. And just as a quick note, that's a, that guy's a guy called Mohammed Anasal who won the Marathon de Sabre. It's this really famous race in running circles. He won that seven times. So meeting him was also pretty cool. That happened after the race, not before. Otherwise, I would have been happier. Um, <clears throat> got to Dubai. Dubai was also great. And <clears throat> uh, the guy there is Haley Gabra Selassie, who's probably the best long-distance marathon runner of all time. He turned up. He ran the first loop with us which I could have wished he didn't, because him at the slowest pace was me at my fastest pace. But it was, it was pretty cool to run with Haley for a while. Um, and that was great, you know, run by along, bright, sunny, nice, fine. And that just left Sydney. And so we arrived in Sydney, and truth be told, I was broken. It was, I was, I'd had it. <clears throat> um, by the time I arrived, I had frostbite in two toes, I had a fractured right ankle, I had knees that wouldn't bend, and my legs got really, really puffy from going, I don't know whether it was the airplane travel or whether it was the, the running or what, everything, but I could sort of stick my finger in and my, just leave a dimple in my leg, um, like they're really swollen and horrible. <clears throat> and my wife was kind enough to fly down, to see me at the start, and give me some encouragement. So she flew down to Hong Kong and she saw me and she goes, honey, you look great, and I'm thinking, You've lied to me twice in your life, I reckon, but that's one of those times right now. I look shocking. <laughs> but somehow it got me to the starting line, so that was cool. Um, that was very kind of her. And basically, the guy in second place was 45 minutes behind, but Sydney was his hometown, and every one of his mates had turned up, and they were going to see him take back those 45 minutes <clears throat> and respect to him, because he was... He had something in him that I didn't have. I was blown. And the starting gun went off, and he took off like a rocket. And I basically hobbled off the starting line. I could hardly... I didn't think I was going to finish it. And I got to halfway, and Trulby was there, my wife, and said, look, he's about eight minutes up on you, but you can do this. You know, you've got 45, you've got, what, 37 minutes left to play with. You can make this. And I had this decision to make, because my ankle was pretty bad. Um... Either I play it conservative, and I'll finish, and I'll finish probably second or third overall, on the, and I'll get on the podium, that's pretty good, you're on the podium. Or I go hard, and there's two options. Either my ankle is going to break properly, and I won't be finishing. Um, <clears throat> I'll be the only guy who couldn't make this. Or maybe I win, if things work well. And I've always been an idiot, so I went out hard. Um, <clears throat> so I went out really hard, and I, I honestly don't really remember the, don't really remember the last half of that marathon at all. Um, but I do remember crossing the finish line. And I remember the race organizer handing me a trophy and saying, you've won. Um, <clears throat> I remember the photo photographers from the news media taking my photo. And I remember passing the trophy to Trilby as I passed out on the ground. <laughs> and that's about all I remember from that day. And they got me back to the hotel room and it was all, it was all fine. Um, and I guess, <clears throat> I guess you can sort of take away what you will from it. And it's not for me to lecture you guys on, on what message you should get, but there's two things that I took away from it. Firstly, as I say, I really wasn't that guy. I was just an everyday guy. Um, but I had something I wanted to do. And I had people who supported me, who were instrumental in making that happen. And I didn't listen to the people who... who didn't listen to people who didn't want me to do it, because there were people out there who said, you can't do this and you weren't going to make it. And some of my friends said that. Um, and I guess my point being to that is anyone can do it if you want to. It doesn't have to be running some stupid race around the world. It's whatever you want to do, you can do it. And the second thing that took me a very, very long time to learn, took me 40 years to learn, is that you've got to work with people. Um, because I went into this pretty much aiming to win. And I went into this, as we all went into this race, lining each other up, working out who was going to win and who wasn't 
and how to beat them. And I realised that for something, or for a lot of things in life, you've got to work with people. And you've got to work with people who, who are your friends, and you've got to work with people who maybe aren't your friends. Um, and you've got to work with your competitors, and you've got to work with your teammates, and you'll kind of bring each other all up in doing that. So I guess that was about my experience. I said one quick thanks. I had a few people to thank, but mainly also to play a short video from Sunbeam that they asked me to put on to say thanks to them and to, to, to get through it. There should be sound, but I'm not sure how to make it work from their computer, but there's words to, to, to read. So thank you all very much. Thank you. David, every, is there's any questions, please raise your hand. And if you're from a media outlet, please identify yourself and the organization you're working for. So um, any questions from the floor? Oh, gentleman at the back. I, I'm not from a media. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. We raced Gobi together, didn't we? Which one? Were you at Gobi? No, my wife was at Gobi. Yeah, yeah, I met you at Gobi. Yeah, 2009. Time. Nice to see you guys. How's it That's doing? Right. My goodness, old friends. <laughs> I, went, I was inspired by that and went to Tahara and then uh, Atacama. A Respect years later. to you. Um, so that's, ha having that experience, I'm, I'm curious to ha what is going through your mind in those races. Now, obviously, you did seven and seven days and the Moroccan one wasn't a very nice one. Mm. But what do you do to, to calm your mind or, or what would you, what, what's going through your mind in those times? You're right. I mean, <clears throat> I actually find it sounds, and you, you know it, you're a distance racer, you know what happens. You've got to be careful of not going a little bit stir crazy. Um, the thoughts bang around, they bang around, they get louder and louder and louder, especially as you're racing by yourself. Um, and I mean, of course, thoughts about self doubt and so forth, but also just you get quite bizarre with the thoughts. So I guess I had a couple of strategies. That was one of the things that talking to the other guys out there on the, on the track made it much easier for me. You know, you talk to them about what their cat was called and what they did for a living and whatever. You, it's, it's amazing how interesting people are when you, you, know, when you, when you get down to the nitty gritty. Um, <clears throat> and it was also fascinating with the other guys there. They, each one of them had a story to tell about why they were there and what they were doing and, and you could sort of eke that out. Over, and you sort of form this bond with people that, as you well know, you don't, you don't really you don't get to that deep layer of people in general society. Um, so that, that was one thing that kept me going. I do listen to music a bit, but not a whole lot. Um, and I do, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly so, I'm normally, I don't know whether the right word is not enjoying myself enough that I can't think about other stuff, but I'm normally struggling enough that I have to just focus on putting one foot in front of the other and keep it going most times, especially when I'm trying to do well. Yeah, it's all, and, and you know, you have to get really religious about your, your pacing and your nutrition and when you eat, and it's not just go out and run, there's a whole methodology to it, and that keeps me occupied as well. Any more questions? <clears throat> Hello, I'm Melanie Nutbeam, that was really, really inspiring. Um, I've got lots of questions actually, but I'll just um, ask two. Um, what sort of times were you aiming for for your marathons? What were your average times? And were you aiming to beat any of your personal bests or just to go with the group in the end? And how did you choose the venues that you ran in? Um, okay, so basically first as far as personal race times, I th I, I, I'm really awful that I don't actually remember my race times that much, but I think I did 321 in Antarctica, um, which was, um, I think, I think that was a record for Antarctica by about 12 minutes over the last fastest time in the continent. Um, my average race time was somewhere around three hours, 30 minutes, which is slow. Um, and you have to wind it back up to about 80% in your normal pace because you can't go flat out. Um, I'm not the world's fastest marathon runner. I think my PB was out of Boston, which was a 254. Um, but guys who are good will, as you well know, even good local runners can do 230. So I'm not the world's fastest runner out there. I am the world's stubbornest runner out there, maybe, um, which was the difference. <clears throat> but definitely, you're not trying to run at your top pace, otherwise you'll blow yourself apart. Um, as far as choosing the, the race course, the, the venue, the guy I emailed, Richard, who uh, was the race organizer, actually figured it all out. Um, I had a slightly different route map, because I wasn't going to start in Antarctica proper, because to get down to Antarctica by itself is a nightmare logistically, unless you 
are very fortunate, you know. Sorry, closer. Sorry. Um, yeah, the getting down to Antarctica is quite difficult otherwise, so he figured out the main logistics of it all. We also had a pretty good thing where the airline said that if we missed a flight, we were allowed to go on the next flight. They sort of, they came on board and helped us just in case anything went wrong. Um, so that was pretty cool. Um, I, I, please. <clears throat> My name is Jonathan Mock. I'm just curious how your recovery each day, what you did differently, and especially you're planning for seven days and in terms of nutrition, stretching, and so forth, and with all the flying. Yeah, How true. did you go about all that? Um, I should tell you an answer that I would have read out of a textbook, but I will tell you the real answer. I'm not really particularly good at that kind of stuff. I, after each race, straight away, I'd have some kind of uh, drink with protein shake for, for drinking that. I'd put on compression tights, um, and they're the ones that go right from your ankles up to your hips. <clears throat> I had a compression shirt as well, but I found I just couldn't breathe when I wore it, so I didn't bother with that. Um, other guys out there had foam rollers and did yoga, and like I said, I've never really understood that kind of stuff, so I just put my feet up and had a rest. Um, yeah. The flying, I, I think, I think you raise a good point because I think the flying is actually the worst bit for you. I didn't realize. I think the reason my legs got so puffy and like your ankles get swollen on a plane. If you do that, like what must have been 14 flights in 10 days, it just it's not good for you. Um, a couple of the flights were business class, but most of it was sit up. Um, and the Russian plane was certainly not business class. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so there wasn't really much time to to recover. Yeah. And, and it's funny, the first 5Ks of each marathon were just awful. You're trying to, it's like your legs are stuck together. Uh, lady at the front. Generally speaking, how do you get how do you deal with injuries in training? And second question, does your experience as a veterinarian help you in terms of managing the physiology of repetitive long distance racing? If you're asking us taking any animal drugs, the answer is definitely no. <laughs> um, no, jokes aside, um, injuries, yeah, it happens to everybody, and I, I, I think that's probably the difference of having a really good coach. I mean, I, I work with someone online, not someone who sees me face to face, but they can tell by the data that I upload them whether things are not going well for me, and they will back me off when it's not, when I'm being silly. I did do one long run to prove myself how fit and awesome I was just before heading off to this race, where I ran over Faino Shan, which is a big mountain in Kowloon, and I decided I was going to race the guys riding push bikes when I was running it, uh, just before the race, which was just idiot and I strained all the tendons on the other side of my foot, and that was about a week out. Um, and I have a very good physio here um, who helped me a lot to get through that. I don't get that badly injured, touch wood. Um, I'm sure I will now after saying that. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what I do. Veterinarian-wise, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I guess I have an understanding of the physiology to some degree, um, but I think you're always worst off when you're your own patient. And I think my coach's probably much better at knowing where I am than anything else. Yeah. Any more questions? There. My name is Robin Wong. I'm not a runner, but I think what I, I like to understand, I mean, uh, obviously it's, it's something very incredible you did, but, um, but what is, you know, your real purpose of of doing that, you know, what, 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 what is, you know, what, why, why you do want to do this? You would not believe how many people have asked me that. And I still haven't got a good answer. I'm just, I'm just stupid. Um, <clears throat> I, I got to be honest with you. I wasn't really looking. Saying this in front of all of you now, with all everyone look at me time, I wasn't really looking at getting publicity for myself, and I didn't make a big deal of it to anybody before I left. It got picked up by the South China after it was in Reuters because Reuters was there covering it. So I was kind of as surprised as anyone when it all became big news. <clears throat> and I remember Trulby was on the phone to the South China at 3 a.m. the day the race finished because they wanted interviews and I was lying in bed with my head in the clouds not knowing what was going on. Um, as far as looking at what I was trying to get out of it, I really need to go forward, otherwise I go backwards. And I need to have something to do, otherwise I fear becoming that lazy, overweight guy again. And 
I keep trying to find a target that I can push towards. Yeah. Uh, just, just to mention, Truby's wife is right there. Put your hand there. <laughs> Our, his biggest supporter. <laughs> Any more questions? Lady at the front, and then the gentleman. Yeah, to exactly what you just said. What are you doing now? It's not every run in Hong Kong, not just like boring or like. What is it worth getting up at all? Like you need to, you need to have something bigger, right? Um, I don't exactly know. I there is talk of going to South America next year and trying to break a trans Amazon record, um, but we're trying to work that out. Um, the Amazon has never been crossed by bicycle before. I think it's possible. I'm going to see. But. She's given me that she wants to come. That's why. <clears throat> but we will see. I, I, that depends on a lot of things. I'm working with some people over there at the moment trying to make it happen. That's kind of the next project. But if that doesn't work out, there's always something. There's always something. Uh, gentleman there. Oh. <clears throat> Is any questions from the left side of the room? Seems quite quiet over there. Or you guys, any questions? Oh, lady at the back. Okay. I'm confused as to how you got from uh, being friendly matey all running together to the gloves are off and I'm now going to whip that guy in the last race. Um, I think, I mean, there's a deep psychology that goes on with stage racing and you see it with stage racing on bicycles and, and any kind of thing that's over multiple days. I, <clears throat> we all wanted to win. And we all went there for one thing. And I would give him full credit if he could have beaten me and taken 45 minutes off me on the last day. He deserved that. <clears throat> I got a phone call from a close friend. One of the guys actually who met me cycling up the road when I was overweight. And I got a phone call just before starting in Sydney. And he said, your mate has to take 45 minutes off you, which means he has to run a 3.15 marathon and you have to run a four hour. And in his life, he's never run a 3.15. And in your life, you've never gone as slow as four hours. And halfway through that race, he was targeting for about 3.13. And I was targeting for about four hours. And I thought, oh, crikey, it's all gone. Um, I guess to answer your question, you work with people, but at the end of the day, you all went there to achieve something. And I didn't go there achieve or lo looking to let him win. And he didn't go there looking to let me win. Um, and whoever won, won fair and square. <clears throat> his mates turned up and paced him, um, and I have absolutely no complaint about that, because if I turned up in Hong Kong, half the guys in this room might be there saying, you go, and that's, that's fair, that's the way it's played. He didn't do anything unfair in that. That was, he put in a good effort. Um, any more questions? Oh, another gentleman at the front. My voice has gone a bit. But, uh, <laughs> so is mine, it seems. Great achievement, David, first of all, and Shorby. <laughs> Um, how do you run on eight toes? Um, actually... Did you lose the toes? I lost about the last, I guess, half a centimetre. Um, and it's the... Like, you got your, your big toe, then you got the second toe. My second toe was always a little bit longer than my big toe. And so I used to rub on my socks and get blisters. And actually now it's really... It's actually a lot better, because it's actually the same length as my big toe. So in a strange way, it's actually worked out really, really well. <laughs> But no, it's, 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 I've lost about the last half a centimetre, which um, it, it, it just looks kind of like it's been really badly burnt and shiny now. It's, it'll be fine, but it's, it's shorter, definitely, and in a strange way, that suits me just fine. Um, what was your diet like prior? Uh, did you have to eat a lot of carbs? Did you have to gain weight, extra weight to sustain before the yourself race? before the race? Or? Um, before the race... I actually was a real pain in the neck as far as dieting goes and put my poor wife through not going out to dinner for about six months. I pretty much didn't eat much red meat. Um, I ate a bit of fish, um, but mainly sort of plant-based diet that was natural. And I had this kind of rule that if I could see in one step where it came from, I could eat it. You know, if I could see where you could grow it or where you could farm it, I could eat it. But if it came in a packet, I'd try and avoid it. So that meant... Um, not much refined sugar, not much alcohol, not much processed foods. I got down to about, oh, I don't know, I wasn't that lean, about 64 kilos before the race. 
Um, I think my natural body weight's about 67. Um, I managed to put all that back on in the week after the race. Um, but yeah, you've got to be lean going into these things, and every kilogram less you carry is, is, is easier on your joints and on your times. Yeah. During the race, I had airplane food, which is not really the diet for a whole week of running, but there's nothing else. Uh, any last questions from the floor? What shoes do you run in? Um, in Antarctica, I had Salomon like snowproof shoes, um, which were fine. Um, the rest of it, I was running in New Balance um, 780s. Um, I took a few pairs because you wear this, you, you can't run the same ones every day. I, I don't know if there's any magic formula. I find some fit some guys and others fit other guys. Um, and the New Balance 780s fit me fine. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. Everyone give a warm thank you, thank you. Dr. Geffen. I should also just quickly say, if anyone, you can all find me pretty easily, like if you Google my, you can find my email address. If anyone has any questions about running or wants any help, you're more than welcome to email me. I'm happy to give you feedback.